Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I want to note at the outset that the Senator from Rhode Island took his questioning uh, as an opportunity to impugn the residents of North Carolina and the residents of Texas as having a penchant for bigotry. And, and I appreciate the compassion from the Senator from Rhode Island. I will point out, I'll let you rise to the defense of your own state, but I will point out in the state of Texas uh, that we had a few, just a few years back three statewide elected African American officials, all Republican, I might note, uh, which I believe at the time was the most of any state in the Union, and I think it's the case that Rhode Island has none. Well, and I would note as well. For the record, I apologize to my colleague if he takes any uh, umbrage about my reference to the general residents of Texas. This was a specific quote from a federal court decision in Texas referring to the decision makers in that case. So Senator Cruz, you have 30 additional seconds. Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, yesterday, you had some discussion with Senator Lee uh, about what it means to be a textualist. Uh, and I want to go back and revisit that conversation and ask for someone at home who's watching this, um, why should it matter to them uh, if a judge is a textualist? What, what difference does that make to somebody not involved with the Supreme Court? Senator, it goes to the foundation of the Constitution and the system that the framers designed uh, with a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch that were all separate. As was said in Federalist 78, the um, judiciary does not exercise will, but it exercise, exercises judgment. The policy decisions are made by the legislative branch with the president, of course, in terms of signing legislation. So the House, the Senate, and the president. The president enforces federal law, comes to the judiciary. When we interpret a statute, if we, uh, as judges, uh, must adhere to the text of the statute, why is that? Two reasons, uh, I think, are paramount. The first is the statute as written is what was passed as a formal matter by the Congress, by the, both houses of the Congress, signed by the President into law. So as a formal matter, that is the law. So if we are going to exercise judgment, not will, we need to adhere to the law as passed, and the law as passed is reflected in the written words that were went through both houses and signed by the president. Uh, secondly, in supporting that, as a practical matter, legislation is a compromise. And within the Senate, within the House, with the president as well, lots of compromises are inherent in any legislative product. Now, that's what my experience shows. That's what I know your experience shows as well, Senator. So when uh, a case comes to court, a statute comes to court, you know, we upset the compromise that you so carefully reached and where people might have given up this for that in terms of the legislative final language. And we then insert ourselves after the fact into the process and upset the compromise if we don't stick to the actual words of the text of the statute as passed by Congress. So as both a formal matter of what the law is and as a practical matter of not inserting ourselves into the legislative process and upsetting the legislative process, it is critical that judges stick to the law as written, the text of the statute as passed by Congress and signed by the President. What in your view is, is the proper role, if any, uh, for legislative history and statutory adjudication. As you know, different justices have had different views on this. Well, I think all judges are uh, much more skeptical of legislative history than they once were. That's uh, the influence, uh, as you know, Senator, uh, largely of Justice Scalia, but really very mainstream now to be very skeptical of legislative history. And again, uh, two reasons support that skepticism if not outright refusal to use it. Uh, the first is that the legislative history, and by that I mean the committee reports or the floor statements made by individual members on the floor of the House or Senate, uh, are not part of the law as passed. And that's important because it would be very easy, and I've said this in my articles, for Congress, if there are a paragraph or a page or more in the legislative history and a committee report that was really important, 
we'll put it into the law, put it into the introduction of the law, have it be part of the law that's passed. When it's a committee report, it might have just been, been seen by one committee in one house, might not have even been seen by the other house. The president, of course, who's part of the process, might never have seen it. So to rely on that is to uh, upset the formal uh, process by which law is enacted in the United States. So too, again, the legislative history, the committee report, uh, is not part of the compromise that's reached between the House and the Senate and the President, at least not ordinarily. And so you're allowing one committee, for example, or one member to go down to the floor of the House or Senate and to say something that will shape subsequent judicial interpretation and upset the careful compromise that's reflected in the text that's passed by the Senate, passed by the House, and signed by the President. So again, both formal and practical reasons why skepticism of legislative history uh, is warranted and why Justice Scalia, I think, was able to persuade uh, justices across the spectrum, judges across the spectrum, that legislative history is uh, useful for understanding why something came to be, but not as a tool for upsetting or, or changing your interpretation of the words of the statute. Also yesterday when you were uh, talking with Senator Lee, I, I believe you described yourself as, as an originalist. Yes. Uh, can you explain what that means to you, what you mean by that? And, and why, again, people at home should care? Why, why that should matter if a judge or justice is an originalist? So by originalist, uh, it's important to be clear because there are different things people hear when they hear the term originalist. Uh, there was an old school of original intent, the subjective intentions of the drafters or ratifiers, and that's not really uh, the proper approach in my view uh, for similar reasons to the discussion of legislative history with statutes. By originalist, what I've uh, meant is original public meaning or the constitutional textualism is a term I've uh, used that refers to the same concept, which is pay attention to the words of the Constitution. The, the Constitution, as Article 6 of the Constitution makes clear, is law. It is not aspirational principles. It is law. It's the supreme law of the land. And in that sense, it's superior to statutes, but it is law like stat, uh, just like statutes are, superior law. The Constitution itself, including the amendments, but the original Constitution was itself a compromise. So it's law, and it's a compromise reached at Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. And of course, Madison's notes and the history of that shows all the compromises were reached. Probably the most famous compromise is the compromise that allows for representation according to population in the House, representation according to state in the Senate, the, the Connecticut compromises it's often uh, referred to. It's important for judges, again, not to upset the, the formal law that's written in the Constitution or to upset the compromises reached either in the original Constitution or in the amendments. Now, one, one key thing to add to that is precedent is part of the constitutional interpretation as well, as Federalist 78 makes clear and the Judicial Power Clause of Article 3 also makes clear. So a system of precedent is built into how judges interpret the Constitution and constitutional cases on an ongoing basis. So that's part of the proper mode of constitutional interpretation, an important system of precedent. Okay, thank you. Um, let's shift back to the topic you and I discussed yesterday, which is religious liberty. Uh, which is a topic of considerable interest and importance to a great many Americans. Um, in private practice, you, you wrote an amicus brief in the Santa Fe case uh, for Congressman Steve Largent and J.C. Watts. Uh, could you describe to this committee what that case was about and, and, and your representation there? <clears throat> I will. Of course, Senator Cornyn argued the case as Attorney General for the state of Texas. And... Um, did an outstanding job. I remember participating in the moot court, as the senator uh, recalled. It didn't turn out too well, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> you, did a, you did an excellent job, Senator, as I remember being there. Uh, so the case involved uh, prayer before a football game. And the Supreme Court, of course, has had uh, a number of cases on religious expression in schools. And these are always uh, challenging cases and very fact-specific. But there are two principles that the precedents have set forth. One is 
that school-sponsored prayer at school events uh, is often impermissible, either at the school day, Engel versus Vital, graduations, Lee versus Weissman. At the same time, when students want to express themselves uh, in some way, t-shirt, clothing, or saying their own prayer, say before a football game or other event, the students want to say a prayer uh, for themselves, or there's an open forum where students are allowed to say whatever they want and one student chooses to talk about religion or say a prayer. Uh, that's on the, generally on the free speech uh, side of the House, freedom of religion side of the House of the Supreme Court precedent, which would protect the religious liberty of the individual in that circumstance. The Santa Fe case came, I think Senator Cornyn would say, uh, well, Senator Cornyn would say it came on the free speech, freedom of religion side of the House. The Supreme Court thought that the school was too involved I would say, in the prayer opportunity in that case, and thus attributed the prayer in that case to the school, and the Supreme Court therefore said that the, the prayer in that case was uh, impermissible. It was a very fact-specific decision, I think, based on how some of the actual prayers had gone down in the, uh, in the school district there. And it was, so it was really in the gray area on the facts between these two principles, freedom of Freedom of speech and freedom of religion for individuals on the one hand, no school-sponsored prayer on the other, and those two principles uh, are part of the Supreme Court precedent that I think the courts have applied uh, for a long time now. So, so what led you to want to take on that representation in the amicus brief? Well, I think uh, at that time I worked on several, uh, was asked to work on several uh, cases involving uh, religious liberty and religious speech. I also did a case in the Good New, uh, Amicus Brief in the Good News Club case, and that was a case where a uh, school district allowed use of uh, the gymnasium, auditorium area after school for whatever group from the community wanted to use uh, the, the facility. And they would allow everyone to come in, you know, Boy Scouts, the uh, community, any community group to come in, but they didn't allow religious groups to come in. And that seemed uh, to be discrimination against religion, discrimination against religious people, religious speech. And I was asked to do an amicus brief, which made uh, the point uh, I wrote that made the point that uh, religious people, religious speakers, religious speech is entitled to its place on an equal basis in the public square, including in this case in the school auditorium or gymnasium. The Supreme Court agreed with that principle in that case, uh, stating that discrimination against religion in public facilities and in, in the nature uh, of what was going on in that case was impermissible and a violation of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and uh, therefore unconstitutional. Uh, those cases are important, I think, because it's important that the to recognize that the Constitution, the First Amendment to the Constitution, as well as many statutes, of course, uh, protect religious liberty in the United States, religious freedom in the United States. And as I've said in some of my opinions, uh, uh, we're, we're all equally American no matter what religion we are or no religion at all. And that means religious speakers and religious people have uh, a right to their place in the public square. Another case you, you were involved in as a judge is, is you wrote a dissent from denial of rehearing on Bonk in, in the Priest for Life case. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell this committee about, about that case and, and your opinion there? That was a group uh, that was uh, being uh, forced to provide a certain kind of health coverage uh, over their religious objection to their employees. And uh, under the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act, uh, the question was, first, was this a sub substantial burden on the religious exercise? And it seemed to me quite clearly uh, it was. It was a technical matter of filling out a form in that case, but that they said filling out the form would make them complicit in the provision of uh, the uh, abortion-inducing drugs that they were, as a religious matter, objected to. Uh, second question was, did the government have a compelling interest, nonetheless, in providing the coverage to the employees. 
in applying the governing Supreme Court precedent from Hobby Lobby, I said that the answer to that was yes. The government did have a compelling interest following Justice Kennedy's opinion in Hobby Lobby said the government did have a compelling interest in ensuring access. And then it came down to the least restrictive means prong of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And that prong of the act, uh, to my mind, uh, is an opportunity to see is there, is there a win-win in some respects? In other words, the government interest in ensuring health care coverage, can that be provided without doing it on the backs of the religious ob objector? So that's what the court's looking for. In that case, Professor Volokh's written about that. And in that case, it seemed to me that the government had avenues to uh, ensure that the coverage was provided without doing so on the backs of the uh, religious objectors. And I so ruled following the Supreme Court precedent in Hobby Lobby and in a subsequent case, uh, Wheaton College, where they had an order that I followed and seemed to me to dictate the result that I identified in the Priest for, uh, priest for Life dissent. Another case, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, just to reiterate, was overwhelmingly passed by Congress in the early 1990s and signed by President Clinton and was an important addition to the protection of religious freedom in the United States to uh, supplement the constitutional protection that exists in the Free Exercise Clause. Well, and I would note, uh, much like yesterday when we discussed your pro bono representation of the synagogue, that priest for life using the paradigm that some on the Democratic aisle have suggested of little guy versus big guy, by any measure, the priest for life were the little guy against the almost all-powerful federal government. And in that opinion, presumably because you felt the law dictated it, you cited uh, with the priest for life in that, in that decision. That, that's uh, correct, Senator, and I think in a lot of the religious freedom cases that the Supreme Court's had, that's been the case. There was a prisoner in an opinion written by Justice Alito, I, I believe uh, unanimous opinion, where the prisoner is being for a Muslim prisoner was being forced to shave his beard in violation of his uh, religious beliefs. Justice Alito, as I recall, wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court saying that was a substantial burden on his religion and was not uh, necessary, and, and that's just another example of how religious liberty protects uh, all of us, no matter what our religious beliefs are, uh, and that's an important principle, foundational principle, both of the Constitution and of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Another case that you were involved in in your career that stood out to me personally, just uh, being a Cuban-American, uh, is that as I understand it, in November 1999, when Elian Gonzalez came to this country as a young child. Uh, and sadly, the federal government ended up coming into the home he was staying with machine guns, taking him into custody and re removing him to Cuba. Uh, that, that you represent, you worked on, on Elian Gonzalez's case pro bono uh, against the INS returning him to Cuba. And, and, and uh, if, if you could uh, talk about that case a little bit to the committee. Yes, thank, thank you, Senator. I was asked by uh, another uh, person in my firm who had gotten a call from someone in Florida whether we could on an emergency basis do, as I recall, a rehearing and bank petition in the 11th Circuit and then a cert petition in the Supreme Court on a really very short notice because of, uh, he was going to be returned. Uh, the question was really uh, due process, what kind of hearing needed to be held before the INS returned him to uh, Cuba. Uh, it was a question under the Refugee Act as uh, what that required and also a question under the Due Process Clause. And interestingly, uh, it seemed that the INS had not, uh, was interpreting the Refugee Act in a way that seemed a stretch of the statutory langu language and it was not in some kind of formal regulation. So the question of Chevron deference to an informal agency position was a question in the case. And I, I wrote the cert petition and the in-bank petition before that saying that the agency was stretching the language of the statute beyond recognition and was doing so in a way that was entitled to no deference because it was not in any kind of formal uh, regulation, which uh, years later turns out <clears throat> to be a position the Supreme Court has agreed with in terms of administrative law. But uh, in that case, 
Uh, I got involved because I was asked to get involved on a moment's notice in a case of importance for people who needed help. And, and, once and let me just ask one, one final question. You've been nominated to the highest court in the land. Um, as you know, there's another highest court in the land, that is the basketball court <laughs> yes. atop the U.S. Supreme Court courtroom. Yes. Um, and I believe that, that no sitting justice has played regularly there since, since Justice Thomas many years ago when he was a much younger justice. Uh, if you are confirmed, do you intend to, to break that tradition and return to having a justice play on, on the highest court in the land? Well, I do. Uh, if, if fortunate to be confirmed, I will. Uh, Justice Thomas did at some point get injured, so I hope that precedent <laughs> is not one that I, uh, that I would follow. But if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, yes, indeed, Senator. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. I'm very glad to hear it. Yes. Well,